Good morning. Great to see you out today. Those of you that are joining us online, thank you for watching and being a part of our church family, even from wherever you are today. Thank you and welcome to Southgate Church. <clears throat> we uh, definitely be praying for the ladies on the way back from the women's retreat. It was great. We had like 35, 36 ladies or something went to that this last weekend, and, and uh, just super cool. They were, they were going to, they called me up, all of you husbands, they're staying another day. So you still have kids, you know, oh, no, I'm kidding. What? They didn't tell me that. <clears throat> yeah, it's just going to go. They're having revival there, and <clears throat> they're not leaving. <laughs> it's just going to keep going. Yeah. What, what in the world? What? So is Children's Church. They're going to keep going. They're going to have revival over in Children's Church this morning. So they're going to stay in there too. Yeah. But anyway, pray for them. They're, on, they're going to be on their way back. Some of them are probably already on their way back and be praying for them. Also, tomorrow is President's Day. <clears throat> this is President's Day weekend. And uh, I want to encourage you, take that time tomorrow. You know, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. You know what, just because you have a leader that you may not always agree with or may not like this or like that, the Bible tells us we're to pray for our leaders. We're to pray for those, the Bible says, who God has placed over us in authority. And I don't know about you, but right now in our world, our leadership, our president, the vice president, all of those around him, all those leading in the military, our state here, they need our prayers. They absolutely need our prayers. You know, this week I had a, had a really great meeting <clears throat> with uh, one of our local representatives, went downtown to the city of Phoenix and had a meeting um, with uh, one of our representatives here. And uh, it, was seri- it was just very, very cool because we got a chance to pray together after we met. Um, and he's not, he's not a conservative at all. When, when I say that, we're on two different political bents. But he was very respectful and open, allowed us to pray together talk about some things, and, and I'm just really believing God for a huge open door there um, for him to be able to speak on behalf of, of the community. And so I want to encourage you, pray for these people. Get involved with them. Find a common ground um, where you can have conversation and go begin to serve your community in a way um, that you can both agree on together and help get some things done. Can you say amen to that? Um, so I encourage you, use tomorrow as an opportunity to pray for folks. Um, so I also wanted to give out our Super Bowl Challenge winner. How many of you watched the game last week? <clears throat> it, was, it was fun. It was really fun. It was fun. I got a chance to go um, hang out with Roger. Really appreciate Roger being here last week. Uh, last week. Don't forget tomorrow he's heading to uh, Myanmar. Tomorrow, he'll be gone for six weeks, heading over there, over there to minister in their Bible school and stuff going on there, so pray for him. But he and I and my son Seth went out and hung out with my dad, so that was really fun. The company is always better than the game. No matter what kind of game it is, it's always fun getting to hang out with friends and stuff. So. But anyway, the winner for the Super Bowl challenge was Nate Sund. And he was here in the first service. We had a couple of people really close. We had one that actually, I think, picked the score, but not the team. It was the wrong team. So um, anyway, my score, I was shocked. My score was really close. It was just right, a little bit different than this. But Nate, Nate's son won. He picked the score. Chiefs 37, Eagles 31. So that was really good. And, and I was mad at him this morning. So... I was actually close, thought I was going to win, but it didn't happen. But anyway, it, it, it was fun. Uh, real quick, also, uh, just to let you know, our Connect groups are going to be starting up in a couple of weeks. So if you have not ever, if you have never been involved in a small group, I want to encourage you, this is a chance for you to do that. Small groups are so important to your development as a Christian, for your maturing process as a Christian, is to get involved in a small group of other believers, begin to have discussions, talk about things that are, that are going on, how to apply the Word of God in your life each and every day. We have a number of groups that are going to be meeting on Sunday. We have some groups that are meeting Friday night. We have child-friendly groups. If you have kids you want to bring them, we're going to take care of that. Um, we have child-unfriendly groups. Um, 
For those of you who don't want to go to a group with kids, we have those. And, you know, so come on, get involved. Sign up. You'll see the sign-ups back there. I'm doing a group. Um, Ron and Claire are going to be doing a group. We have groups on Friday. There's a group going on at Donnie and Sharon's house. Um, all of these are in the area. There's some one group that's going to be in Tempe if you live that direction. Another one on Friday night over here in our area. There's a lot of groups that are going to be meeting. and there, Look on the back table back there. Next Sunday we'll have everybody stationed out there in their groups and where they're going to be meeting so you can ask questions. But sign up, get involved, and we have a, a quick, I guess, video trailer of what the group uh, this time around our sessions are going to be about. So check this out. If we don't really talk about today's issues, then what is it that we do talk about? What is the point of our faith if we can't relate it to anything else that people are having to think about every day? There's only three basic worldviews that religions fall into. There's theism, there is a God. There's atheism, there isn't a God. Or there's pantheism, that everything is a God. The non-Christian worldviews are depressing and they don't fit reality. Everyone's going to have to decide where they fall because our culture is challenging them directly. You see, we're all yearning to be a part of something that's bigger than who we are. I think in all of our hearts and souls, we know something is wrong. No matter the worldview, no matter the religious background or lack thereof, what universally we can agree on is that there is deep brokenness. Of course, there's still goodness, there's still, there's still beauty, all those things, but it's, it's broken, right? And we're broken, and we're broken people. And then, you know, there's this question, you know, who or what is going to make things right? I actually think Jesus is the person who can bring the most coherence and meaning to the world as we see it today. There's no good reason to doubt that he existed in the time and the place that the Bible discusses. And we need to not shy away or apologize for what the gospel is. If people did that, the majority of society and culture did that, that's going to have enormous implications and it's going to radically change our world around us. That's that good news. is good preaching. Is that good news? That's good news and good preaching. Give me a high five. Uh, I want to encourage you. Get involved in groups. There's going to be some great discussion. There's six areas of topic. The group will run six weeks. It's going to be broken up into different times simply because we got Easter and different events that come. So each group will design what works best for them over a six-week period of time. But I encourage you, get involved. You're not going to get to know people by looking at the back of their head on a Sunday morning. How many of you would agree with me there? You're not. The way you get involved, the way you grow... The way you are able to apply the Word of God to your life is by getting involved in a small group. And you know, today it's important that you check and see what it is you do believe. This, this group is designed for discussion. This group is designed to talk about issues going on in our world today, be able to look at those from a biblical viewpoint, and be able to have solutions to that. So I want to encourage you, come out. This is a great chance for you to check and see, do I really have a biblical worldview? Or have I allowed part of the world to come into my view and I'm making the Bible fit into my view instead of me fitting into what God says? And I think that is hugely important in our world today. So check those out and we'll have more information for you um, as we get it and we'll give it out there too. You can even go online and sign up also. All right. Well, this morning in our time together... Um, and over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the importance of understanding love from a biblical perspective. I haven't gone into all of the different meanings of the word love in the New Testament. There are five different Greek words that, that uh, explain or describe this, this word love in the New Testament. I haven't gotten into all of that. I've talked about more of a practical application point. How do you apply the word love and how do you apply this activity, this thing we know as love, in our world around us. We've learned that we cannot love others best until we love God the most. We learned that we as human beings are lost, we're imperfect, we're flawed, 
we're sinful, and we cannot truly love anyone in a biblical way, and that even includes loving God Himself, unless we receive the love of God into our hearts that come through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to learn to allow God to love us first, and then deposit His love into our spirit before we're capable of being able to adequately love other people. Loving others is not easy. How many of you have figured that out? Loving people in a Christ-like way is not easy. It's easy to love the people who are lovable. But it's not easy to love people when somebody does something against you or a person doesn't agree with you or they're in opposition to what you believe in. In your convictions, it's not easy to express a love for them in a Christ-like way. And that's what we're talking about. We're learning to understand that we connect with God first, then we learn to love others. You cannot love people until you get the love from God and love God the most in order for us to love people the best. See, when you and I learn how to love then we'll be able to love others the best that we can. Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, which is really our foundation for why we do what we do. That's why here at Southgate, this becomes our number one goal. For every single person that comes here, and for us, even that have been here for 30-something years like me, some of you that have been here less, we have to remind ourselves, we have to always stay focused on loving God first and foremost because everything else flows from that. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So everything else in the Ten Commandments, you know, Jesus did not nullify the Ten Commandments. He didn't remove them. He said, when you fulfill these two, everything else flows from these. When you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, yourself, and you love others, all of the other commandments will flow right in place, and God will put those, he said, in your heart. This is, there's a reason why Jesus said the second greatest commandment is like the first. And the reason he said that is if we love God with all our being, we'll be able to love our neighbor as ourselves. So this morning in our time together, we're going to talk about four ways that we can learn to love others best by looking at how Jesus loved others in this message titled, Learn to Love Like Jesus. Now, I'm not going to specifically go through all of these different things that Jesus did. I'm going to talk about the heart of Jesus as it's proclaimed in the New Testament to us as believers. So if you look with me in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, and I encourage you to read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's probably one of the greatest books in understanding the love of God than any other book in the New Testament um, because he talks a lot about it. And I'm going to read uh, this from a couple translations so we can get a clear understanding of what kind of love that we're talking about. We're not talking about love as a human type of love, but love that only comes from God, and the Bible says that God is love. So 1 John 4, 7, uh, the Apostle John says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves, and that's that Greek word agape, and you can look it up. That's what he's talking about. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. And then the Amplified Bible says, Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. So in other words, the more you know God, the more of His love is going to manifest in your life so that you can love others the way God loves you and I. If you struggle to love people well, here's some good news. Love can be learned. 
Love can be learned. That means the more you practice, the better you'll become at it. No matter how you loved or how you've been loved in the past, you can become amazing at loving other people when you allow yourself to receive the love of God into your own heart. Love is a skill that can be learned. Love is a skill that can be learned. In fact, God wants you to become a master at this skill. If he didn't, he wouldn't tell you to love others. Because if he tells you to do something, then that means he's going to give you the capability to fulfill the potential of what he has asked you and commanded and challenged you to do. If Jesus said for us to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that means he's going to give us the ability to be able to do that. But it's amazing, yet how many people never learn really how to love someone? It's true. You know, de- depending on your experience as, as a child growing up, how you saw it demonstrated in front of you, how you saw it lived out, how you received love. You know, there's even a book out there right now, The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read that book? If you haven't read that book, I encourage you to read it. Because it talks about, there. this guy broke it down into different ways. He says, people give and receive love in, in five different ways. Of course, that changes a little bit as you get older. But in other words, some people, they want quality time. That's the best way to show love to others. This, that type of personality is quality time. And other ones, but I encourage you to read it. So learning to love um, is a skill. We can, we can develop it. You know, and the question is, do you want to be known as a person of extraordinary love? When people speak of how you love others, do you want them to say how, how he loves you regardless of where you've been? She loves you no matter what you've done. Do you want to be remembered for how much you owned or accomplished in life? Or do you want to be remembered for how well you loved others? A perfect example of the power of love was lived out by a guy that, that I had the opportunity to meet and some of you met. Uh, a world-known evangelist by the name of Dr. T.L. Osborne. Some of you have not known him. He passed away 10 years ago or so, but he was probably credited with reaching more people on the face of the earth than any human being alive, and that included Billy Graham. Um, His ministry lasted 60 years. It spanned almost every nation on earth. He reached millions of people for Christ in Puerto Rico, He is considered to be the father of evangelical Christianity. Many people that will tell you they're from Puerto Rico, they became a Christian, they'll they'll tell you how it happened through their great-grandfather attending a T.L. Osborne crusade in Puerto Rico. He has touched the world. During one of his many Miracle Life crusades, Dr. T.L. was having lunch with this pastor of the largest church in Europe. What happened next stands out in the minds of all the other ministers who were sitting by as one of the most profound leadership moments that they ever encountered. In their words, and they heard it, this pastor of many thousands of people asked T.L., what has been the key to your success in ministry these last 60 years? T.L. pausing for a moment, they said, by as he stroked his big goatee that he had, And with the wisdom of many years, he thoughtfully looked up and simply and profoundly stated, love God and love people. That's the secret of my ministry. Love God and love people. People, loving people was key for him being able to win millions of people to Christ. Loving them. God's word is, And the Holy Spirit will teach you and enable you to love others. But to become extraordinary at it, you need to practice it over and over again. It may feel awkward at first as you learn to love with a greater capacity than is humanly possible, relying on the power of God, the supernatural love that comes from God. But the more you learn to love, the better you'll become at loving unconditionally. And it's something that you can practice. So how can we love others like Jesus loved others? How can we do that? Number one, 
We accept others like Jesus accepts you. We accept people. Followers of Jesus should be the most accepting people in the world. We should be modeling that every day in our life. That this is the starting point of accepting others like Jesus does, is to realize how God accepts you. God accepts you the way that you are. He knows everything about you. He knows all of your flaws. He sees them perfectly and clearly. But He accepts you. You need to truly understand how accepted you are by God so that you can learn to accept other people. Jesus tells us, without a doubt, what He thinks in John chapter 6 and verse 37, that you're accepted no matter what you do. He said, and he said the Father gives me the people who are mine. Every one of them will come to me and I will always... Everybody say always. I will always accept them. Other versions say, I will never drive them away. I will never reject them. I will never cast them out. I will never turn them away. See, the truth is, you can be a Jesus follower your entire life and not truly realize you're accepted and loved by God. See, a lot of times we can do works, we can pray, and we can... Um, attend church we can do all of the religious activities that we know that we should do as a Christian but you have to ask yourself why are you doing those are you doing those because you're trying to get accepted by God or are you doing those because you're accepted by God there's a difference in how you do what you do motive is always important in our lives as Christian people why We do what we do. See, Jesus loved us the way that we were, and we need to love others likewise. And you may say, well, you know, Pastor, that's true, but what about this situation, and what about that? Listen, you can accept people without approving of how they're living. We can accept people without endorsing their way of life, or their lifestyle. Jesus did this with the woman when he caught, that he, he caught in the act of adultery. Something very unique happened there. He accepted her just the way that she was, sin and all. She was caught in the midst of this adulterous situation. They brought her before Jesus, the religious people. What are you going to do? They waited to see what Jesus was going to do. Jesus said to all of them, if you remember any of you without sin, cast the first stone. They all walked away. Jesus said, I have, I'm not going to throw any stones at you either. And Jesus turns to her and tells her these words, go and sin no more. He didn't say what she was doing wasn't, was, wasn't wrong. He's just telling her, I accept you the way that you are. But I want to challenge you, don't stay in that situation. Because it doesn't get, it doesn't get any better. <clears throat> Number two, if you want to live like Je- if you want to love like Jesus does, we must value others like Jesus values us. Value others like Jesus values us. Every person we meet has infinite value to God. You know, it's interesting. Many many years ago, Pastor John and I were in a conversation. I don't even know what brought it up. <clears throat> but he made a statement, and he says, I found out a long time ago that everybody knows something and can do something better than I can. Whether it's a homeless guy, whether it's this person or that person, you right now in this building are better at something than the person sitting next to you. Every one of us has great value in the eyes of God. We're so valued to valuable to God that he created us Jesus died for us his spirit is in us he wants you and I to live with him in eternity he holds you in great value in the gospel of Luke chapter 12 and verse 7 Jesus made this statement to talk about human value he said what is the price of five sparrows he said two copper coins yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. 
for those of you that have hair. <clears throat> well, anyway. In your ears, yeah, I've noticed that, yeah. So he said, don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. All value is determined by two factors, if you think about it. All value is determined by two factors. Number one, who is the creator? Who is the designer? Who is the artist? Okay, for example, I could paint a painting, and I may think my painting is really good, and I can go out there and try to sell my painting and ask as much money as I think I want it, as it's worth, but there's no value to it because they don't know me. But if I put my painting next to a Picasso, whose holds greater value? The person who's the creator and the designer. In our case, God created us. So that places great value on you because God made you. In Ephesians 2.10, it says we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. And guess what? So is the other person. So is the other person that, that we are having a hard time at loving. They are God's masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. This verse reminds us that we are God's masterpiece. We are the greatest creation. We are number one in His heart and mind of all of the creation. Yes, we see the incredible beauty of the earth, the world, the animals, all the intricate detail that God put to all of those, and those are all magnificent and wonderful, but that was not God's greatest masterpiece. You are. The person sitting next to you. The second thing that creates value <clears throat> is what somebody is willing to pay for it. That's what value, that's how value works. You may think something is a value, but if, not, if somebody's not willing to pay you the money for what you think is a value, then it's not. But in our case, God thought you were so valuable, what did He pay for you and me? God paid for us. The Bible says that God gave the life of His Son for us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid for mere, by mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the priceless blood of, blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. That's the price He paid. God doesn't just love you enough to create you and send His Son to die for you. He did that for every person on the planet. He made this plan available for every person on the planet. We need to treat people like we understand God made them and died for them too. See, because when you see that God died for them, Jesus Christ came for them, that changes the value in you and in them too. If Jesus loved people by valuing them, so should we, no matter who they are. We can do that by consistently looking at and listening to the people with whom we're interacting. And what is that? That's simply being respectful and polite. How can we show that? By being respectful and polite. That's how you can show that you value people. Number three, if you want to love like Jesus did, number three, we must, 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 Forgive others like Jesus forgives us. I think of all of the tests of the love of God, this is, this is the biggie. It is. This is probably the hardest one. <clears throat> and it takes the most strength to be able to forgive others for what they've done to you or forgive others for what they have done to somebody that you love. God, though, doesn't keep grudges. He's never trying to get even with us. Jesus paid all the cost for everything that we have ever done. We could look at all of the scripture in the Bible that tells us that God doesn't keep a record of wrong. 
He says, if you come to him and ask him to forgive you, the Bible says that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, every time we do something, he forgives. He forgives. He forgives. Jesus came as an example of God's forgiveness. And he challenges us to do the same. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, Long ago, even before he made the world, he chose us to be in him, to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his sight without a single fault. We who stand before him are covered with his love. See, God had a plan for guilt in our lives long before we had our first breath. Long before we were born, God had a plan. All we have to do is accept it. He already had a plan to forgive you before you ever did anything wrong. God made a way for that. Because God forgave us, He expects us to forgive others. This morning, as I'm standing here and sharing this with you, is there anybody in your life that you need to forgive? See, a lot of people wonder, okay, why do things not work well in my life? How can this other person seems to have things going better for them than I do? You know, there's sometimes there, you know, there are roadblocks that you that you face to the blessings of God in your life. I believe unforgiveness is a huge roadblock. I think I, I believe it's a blessing killer. Why? Because God can't bless you. He said, before you come and even offer your gift at the altar, if you have anything in your heart against somebody, go forgive them. In other words, God's saying, I can't even bless the gift that you give because you're, you're operating outside of my perimeters of blessing. Go and forgive those who need to be forgiven. Colossians chapter 3.13 says, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also, what? Must forgive. Must. See, we have a problem, all of us do, with somebody telling us what to do. We do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. I think that's just the independent nature of humanity. Nobody likes being told what to do. Well, guess what? If anybody has the right to tell you what to do, it's your Creator. And listen, sometimes we sit around and we, and we contemplate and, well, yeah, and this and that. You know, if we were just quick to obey what God tells us to do, it would, it would so quickly change the circumstances in our life if we would just become submissive and obedient to the Word of God and just do what He says. When He says to do it, it would change your world. How many of you would agree with that? It would. So when He says this is something you must do, then don't argue about it. You know, say, Lord, okay, it's hard. You can admit it. You can tell Lord, yeah, it's hard. It's difficult. This is not going to be easy, but I'm going to do it because you told me to do it. Because God forgave us, he expects us to forgive. Also read Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. It's another great scripture about bearing with one another and forgiving each other. See, we don't, we don't always want to make allowances for other people. But it's funny, we want God to make allowances for us, but we don't want to make allowances for others. Isn't that funny? I don't know, you guys are staring at me like I'm the only, I'm the only person that ever thinks that. No, we, we do. We love to be able to come down hard on people, but we don't want any become, anybody coming down hard on us. See, don't, we, we don't meet our own expectations, but we, we expect others to meet ours. God wants us to have the right attitudes in all of this. So if you want to love like Jesus does, number four, we must believe in others like Jesus believes in us. Got to believe in people. Got to believe the best in them. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that love believes the best in others. Love believes the best in others. See, we all have insecurities. We all have faults that we deal with each and every day. Studies have shown 
that the younger you were when you had when you first experienced rejection, the more serious it becomes and impacts your life. So when you were a kid, if you experienced rejection from parents or family or friends at a young age that was really hurtful to you, studies show how that affects you even in your adult years. Because of the way you see yourself is the way that you're going to live your life and the way you're going to treat other people. But the good news is there's a way to reverse the curse of rejection in your life. And how we reverse it is by believing what Jesus says about us instead of what other people say about us by focusing on who you are in Christ and not on who you think you are or what the world tells you that you are. Focus on what Jesus says about you, not what you say about you or what other people say about you. The Bible describes the kind of persistent love that we should have for others that builds people up rather than tears them down. That is his goal. His goal is that everybody would be built up and not torn down. See, if you truly love somebody, you're going to believe the best in them, you're going to expect the best in them, and you'll always stand your ground in defending them. Amen. You will defend them. Why? Because you believe the best in them. You believe in their potential to be the person that God has called them to believe. Because that's exactly what Jesus does for you and I. He believes in us. When He looks at us, He doesn't see us for who we are. He sees us for what we can become. He sees who we are in Christ. He sees who God created us to be. He sees your potential. That's why He believes in us. The Bible is clear that God is cheering us on. God is constantly our cheerleader in life. He is always there plotting for us, encouraging us, there to strengthen us in everything that we do. If you've never memorized a particular passage of Scripture, I wrote it down there in your handout. If you've never memorized anything, memorize this one. Memorize this in Romans 8, 31 and 32. It says, What then shall we say to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us what? All things. So he has given it and released it to you in Christ if we will just receive it. You see, instead of labeling us, he brings out the best in us by telling us who we are in Christ. He wants the best. In you, Then he asks us to do the same thing with other people. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So he encourages us to encourage others to do the same. When we love God, then we learn to love God back. Then he deposits his same heart and his same spirit in us, which challenges us. To love others in the same way that he loved us. So if you want to love others the way Jesus did, focus on and learn how to do these four things. Accept others, value others, forgive others, and believe in others. Accept them, value them, forgive them, and believe in them. So those of you that have people that work for you, if you work for somebody else, you have believe in the people. Believe in those that are around you. Encourage them because God believes in them. If love is a skill that can be developed, uh, no, I say it, love is a skill that can be developed, but it has to be practiced. Look at your neighbor and say, I got to practice. You got to practice. So what are some of the specific ways that you can practice loving others this week and learn to apply those four principles. And this is the thing. If you pray and ask God for opportunities to apply these four things, He's going to give you an opportunity. He's going to give you an opportunity. If you pray, God, help me to forgive. If you pray, God, help me to value somebody. If you pray, God, help me to accept somebody. You're going to get an opportunity to do it. He's going to give you an opportunity to practice 
these four things and cause your love to grow. So that's your decision. To pray and ask God to give you opportunities or not. And you know the funny thing is, you know, people are always trying to find the best ways to to develop relationships and friendships with people. This is the best way. If you want to win friends and influence people, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. When people are around you and they feel valuable when they're around you, you're going to influence their life. You're going to influence them and their life because they'll want to be around you. They'll want to hear what you have to say because whenever they're around you, you value them. You, you treat them great. They understand, I want to be around that person because I, I feel really good when I'm around that person. And then guess what? You want an opportunity to share the message of the gospel with people? Do that. When they find value, when you have proven that you value them, they're going to listen to what you say. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right, let's stand together this morning. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to love people, to influence people the way Jesus did. And Father, we know that this is what He did. He accepted people. He valued them. He forgave them. He believed in them. Lord, we thank You that as we learn to apply these things in our lives with other people, that we'll be able to experience what Jesus experienced when He was here on this earth. In the same way we've loved, we get to be loved by God, help us to love others the same way. And Father, I pray that this message would penetrate deep down into the hearts of people as they interact with each other in the, in the church, as they interact with people in their jobs, in their homes, that they will begin to take these things and apply them to their life. And I know, Lord, that you will bless them as a result. And we ask this, Father, today in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget, back on the back table, there's some sign-up sheets back there for the groups. If you can sign up today, go ahead and do it. If you need to look at your week and everything, come back next Sunday and be ready to jump in there. God bless you. Have a great week.